um, appreciate everyone attending. I think it's our 64th episode of this month in cyber. Great month to be doing it. Obviously, it's Security Awareness Month. If you weren't aware, you are now aware of that also. So you're kind of doing your part. Um, and let's get started. Um, we've got an agenda format that I've been trying to follow in terms of trying to bring you some things from the news, uh, from the trenches, I call it, and then uh, some vulnerabilities just to kind of make sure that we have a well-rounded approach uh, and then obviously flexibility to throw in more things. But we also always try to, um, you know, ground things back where we can. Security needs grounding, right? There's a lot of topics, a lot of areas to go. But if you kind of think of security in these five bucket areas, um, sometimes the goal is not necessarily to protect you from a problem. It's to uh, respond or recover from a problem or just find out that you have a problem with detection. So there are indeed various aspects of security and the NIST cybersecurity framework helps us with that. So let's start with our first topic of in the news. Um, in the news, you know, and these are just a few stories I assembled that I thought might be top of mind or uh, of some interest to you. Uh, this organization um, was a relatively large study, uh, and they studied what's called a temptation score. Uh, and temptation score, just what we needed was another metric for things, but think of the temptation score as how attractive would this be to a outside hacker sort of uh, or attacker. And anything above a 30 is considered very high. So from an internet perspective, um, they looked at devices and IPs, and you know what ports were available on those IPs across the entire internet. And in general, their findings are a little bit sobering. Uh, and hopefully I'm trying to bring these sobering news you know, to your shore so that you're um, cognizant of what, how you might be seen by an outside uh, uh, exploiter. First of all, above 30 is bad again, as you recall. And one of the first things we run into is RDP. Okay, it's a 40. It's a number 40, so extremely attractive for exploiters to go take advantage of. And 25% of organizations have RDP exposed to the internet. Okay. Are you one of them? We hope not. Um, oftentimes RDP ports get opened for ease of access. Uh, we saw there's a spike. Uh, I could show you graphs I believe I did uh, last March back when um, you know COVID happened and people were uh, trying to uh, initiate remote access more frequently and RDP is often the portal for remote access. However, it's just that. It's a portal for remote access and and you really don't want the wrong people exploiting it. There's better ways to secure it um, and mask it and secure it uh, for external access. So in any case, RDP ports, uh, you should be scanning for those. Uh, you should be very cognizant of uh, which ones you have open, if any, and uh, what you should be doing to lock those down. A couple others in the list that I thought were notable, IAS 6, which has not been supported for over six years, 15% uh, of organizations uh, running that. Uh, Cisco ASA firewalls, it's not the firewall themselves that they're attacking, but they're essentially looking for vulnerabilities in the ASA, which have been publicly um, announced. Here are the vulnerabilities, here are the patches to be done to it. Well, if you're not patched, now it's a, suddenly a very vulnerable, and that's an, those were number 30, these are 37s um, in the same ballpark, 38. Microsoft Outlook Web Access, oh, I, I think I had a graphic for this. Uh, Outlook Web Access, uh, only 3% of organizations still have the old uh, Microsoft Outlook Web Access, but highly exploitable. Um, configuration actually is detailed uh, when you ask the server for the configuration. Um, and then uh, Citrix Netscaler uh, 33, uh, a lot of organizations still uh, leveraging that as a technology and it's got some public exploits that have been taken advantage of. So if you are using some of these technologies, they need to be patched. Uh, some of them obviously are not patchable IAS 6, Outlook Web Access. Um, the old uh, legacy Outlook Web Access is no longer patchable. Just a little bit of uh, outside in view. Um, some other stuff that came up in the news and you know, I, I'm not sure where this would be impactful, but it was kind of interesting. Uh, I think John Fedor brought it to our attention. This is a bug that is actually in GPS data, um, and it will roll back the date. Uh, kind of think Y2K-ish, uh, but it'll roll back the date 1,024 weeks to March of 2002. So if you have systems or services that are um, 
reliant on that GPS data, um, the GPS data would be errant, and therefore your date would be errant, and uh, that could cause you know system instability or unavailability or unresponsive. Um, but just kind of a little nuance that occurred. Um, but this raise to the profile of the um, Department of Homeland Security, uh, causing this flare to go up uh, just a few days ago. Uh, you know, this ransomware uh, obviously is, uh, I'm not going to give you a ransomware story this time as much as I'm going to give you some background. Ransomware continues to be a, uh, a problem and, and plaguing. Um, it's impacting uh, one of the topics we'll talk about a little bit today, which is cybersecurity insurance. But one of the other things uh, where there's a battlefront is the ransomware hackers and the government. So, um, the government has uh, had a rule on the books for quite a while and now just recently uh, in September re-emphasized that rule that payments to ransomware uh, gangs in most cases is illegal. You're not allowed to make payments, uh, mostly due to a rule called the OFAC rule. Um, and the OFAC basically does not allow you to pay organizations, especially ones that are connected to criminal governments. Um, some of those uh, criminal enterprises such as like China, Russia, North Korea, where a lot of ransomware comes from, um, you're not allowed to make payments to those families as they know it will tie up and uh, be part of, uh, be used for nefarious purposes. So on that, you know, on one end you have your inability to make payments and, you know, on the other end, is your business, right? Your files, your uh, databases, and your your desire to recover. So it's just another uh, battlefront area where you really need some expertise. Uh, your insurance provider, your legal team uh, need to be skilled and brushed up on who they're calling. Uh, if you are uh, in a negotiation, uh, it has to be someone who's familiar with payment processes so that you're not, you know, putting yourself in a situation where um, you would have uh, enforcement action from the Department of the Treasury. We uh, have, you know, we've seen ransomware uh, and almost on a, I don't know, I'll say at least on a quarterly basis with our customers, uh, where one of our customers uh, or uh, is calling us to help them uh, recover uh, and they're in situations. Um, we've seen firsthand uh, insurance companies and legal teams uh, make some of these calls, do some of these negotiations uh, as, you know, maybe technical, there were some technical weaknesses and capability, inabilities to restore. So um, that kind of provides good context for uh, our next conversation, which I'll call uh, from in the trenches. Uh, in the trenches, I, I really wanted to highlight for you and, and just emphasize as strongly as I possibly can if you have not gone through a cybersecurity insurance renewal, the world has changed since the last time you did. And when I say the world has changed, I'll say specifically the cybersecurity insurance renewal business has changed. My guess is you're going to have either difficulty getting a policy, or if you are able to get a policy, that its rates will be three, four, five, six times what you paid before you will fill out multiple applications. These applications will have very specific questions as I'm about to outline. I've looked across a dozen applications. These are the questions they're asking. Do you have a software and hardware inventory? You're answering yes or no, but you're, uh, and if you answer no, you could be in jeopardy of A, not getting insurance, or B, paying a higher rate. If you answer yes, you don't have to show substantive proof maybe right now during the application process, but you might be asked to later. And furthermore, if you have an event, um, they're going to be asking you for your inventory right then. If you can't show it, it'll be considered a breach of contract and you'll uh, have a difficulty in terms of payments. This is what I've been told from insurance providers uh, that are on the streets doing these things. Inventory is one small area. Another area is security awareness. They want to know that all employees are getting regular security awareness. They want to see the strength of your program. We have a webinar uh, we'll talk about uh, towards the conclusion of this where uh, the security awareness is um, is uh, what a good program looks like uh, will be uh, dispelled. Uh, that event is on Thursday this week. 
They might want special uh, special security awareness programs for people in accounting or financial areas. Um, they want to know about your email. Specifically, they want to know if you pre-screen emails for malicious attachments, meaning do you have an advanced filter in front of that? They want to know if you've implemented SPF, DKIM, DMARC. If you can't spell those or those don't sound very familiar to you, um, those are uh, very uh, well-known technologies for protecting email. Uh, we find a lot of organizations do not have those in place. They want to know extensively about MFA. Uh, your identity, um, MFA, and this is not a simple one-line one, one line question. In fact, I'll read a few of them to you. They want to know if you access email through a web or non-corporate device, do they use MFA? Uh, they want to know if you secure all cloud provider services, uh, meaning all your apps. Do you secure all your remote access to your network, including RDP if you leverage it? Do you uh, have privileged accounts? Uh, when they have privileged accounts such as admins, do they leverage MFA in all situations? And uh, they want to know if you have it on your backup uh, for when you're accessing backup. So MFA is multi-tiered. Uh, it's very, not often a yes, no. Uh, again, uh, you can answer no, uh, but uh, you'd be expecting a corresponding um, either drop uh, from quote, uh, especially MFA and security awareness are kind of top two. Um, endpoints, they want to know about endpoints, next generation antivirus tool, they want to know if you have an EDR tool with centralized logging and monitoring. They want to know if non, uh, if users have admin access to your endpoints. Um, they want to know if you have a protective DNS service. Uh, we leverage extensively Umbrella, uh, which is a Cisco product for protecting uh, many of our customers. Um, they want to know about PowerShell, isolation, and best practices, and so forth. Uh, two more areas. They want to know about detection, kind of what's your ability to know that you have a problem. Are you monitoring admin access for unusual activity? And they want to know uh, if you have a vulnerability management tool and how often you have scans done of your network. And last, but definitely not least, um, one of the ones where they ask, uh, you know, this is your bounce immediately uh, if some of these answers are no is what does your backup and recovery look like? Um, what's your time to restore essential functions? Uh, they're anticipating you're going to have a ransomware event and they want to know that you can get things back in 24 hours and feel confident. And if you're checking that box, uh, when it comes time to it, they're also going to ask you about you know, are things encrypted? Are things air gapped? Uh, is backup MFA enabled like I had mentioned before? Has it been tested in the last three months or six months? Uh, how do you validate the integrity of your backups? These are the questions that are on every questionnaire and uh, your inability to fill it out or your ability to fill it out with yes answers is either gonna prevent or cause uh, you know, some uh, real significant uh, price increases in your... Uh, so this is what we're seeing. It's all over the board um, and we're being brought in in multiple instances to implement a lot of the um, security controls because the, um, uh, the rates are so high that uh, people are uh, trying to get their rates lower uh, as one of the mechanisms, as well as obviously with care and concern for putting in good practices. So that's what we're seeing in the trenches. That's my sum total, I think, that I'm going to give to you. Last, I'm just going to cover a few uh, easy vulnerabilities. So uh, Microsoft uh, patching. Uh, I will assume all of you have a patch program. This is obviously one of the things they ask about in the cybersecurity insurance. And it was funny, I noted many of them said, are your patches implemented on your endpoints, and they meant servers and workstations, in zero to four days, you know, four to nine days, 12 to 28 days, 30 days or more. And then if you're checking 30 days or more, they kind of put you in, you could be not patching or patching, you know, at 45 days, and they're kind of the same to them. Means you don't really have a strong program you're indicating based on your answers and um, I'm not sure this is a client that we want to insure is really uh, what the statement of the of the question answer is uh, really there so patching program um, uh, Microsoft came up with 71 vulnerabilities this month um, several of them I just call attention to uh, exchange server SharePoint server should you still have it uh, and then some hyper-v vulnerabilities uh, many of these had CVSS scores, if you're familiar, that's on a zero to 10 as to how dangerous these could be. 
the exchange one had a 9.0 on it. So uh, four of these were zero days and uh, two of them were being actively exploited in the wild. So time is of the essence. Um, all 71 of those patches need to be evaluated and the patch program needs to unfold in a quick manner. Uh, of note, I think I noted this morning in a meeting, uh, our organization currently patches over 5,000 devices a month, um, and we have uh, primary responsibility for that. So that is a service that can be outsourced to an MSP like ourselves. All right, this last section, uh, and I promise just to spend maybe uh, four or five minutes on it, um, just because I think it's an unfolding uh, uh, unfolding story uh, and I'm hoping to resonate with you is how we come about implementing security controls. I think we all want to be secure, right? I, I think uh, our desire is to do that. And oftentimes uh, the story I'm telling here is one where an organization was provided a assessment of their security and was told, here are the things you need to do. Okay. And there are 14 areas, but there were more like 50 or 60 recommendations they had. So that's their starting point. Is, wow, I got a lot to do. I could look at this on a line item basis. Thank you for categorizing it for me, but there's a fair amount I need to do. What are the priorities to this? I don't know. What's the budget for this? I don't know. I just know I have a problem. And then oftentimes uh, organizations think, well, that's okay. I, I own some security software, whether it be you know uh, a third party or uh, some Microsoft technologies and you know M365 E3. Certainly, even if you blow it up full screen, has a lot of bells and whistles to it. But I don't know how to unfold those relative to my problem, right? So I've got a monumental problem and a monumental solution, and I guess I'm looking for answers. And so. We've developed, uh, you know, a, you can call it whatever you like, crawl, walk, run, um, or a, a maturity model for how to implement based on the priority of either a third-party assessment you had done uh, from another organization, or even if we did the third-party assessment, we can help you prioritize and budget for how to unfold some of the security technologies uh, as we understand the technology. And so in quick fashion, I just kind of want to show you an example of what a crawl, walk, run strategy looks like and how that might unfold. So let's say in the crawl package, uh, we designate that these five areas are your most important to identify and, and, and we'll map them back actually to our original findings or to another organization's original findings about where they saw gaps in your security. And you know we're gonna try and take care of as many low-hanging fruit areas as we can, shore things up maybe in endpoints and email or in your patching, uh, which you, we had mentioned is very important. And obviously if um, your, um, if cybersecurity insurance is your driver for what's uh, causing you to need to shore up some of your security, we'll prioritize the elements that they're prioritizing. But um, in, in a vacuum, right? Nothing, uh, you, you need something to prioritize things and, uh, and certainly we'll always fall back to the NIST cybersecurity framework if you don't have a framework or a operating um, priorities to begin with. But we wanna see your security improve and uh, we'll help you unfold a plan to do so. So taking this down just one more level and I won't do this with every uh, piece, but let's just take a look then at how we might unfold using the technology we had mentioned, uh, maybe this is uh, M365, and I just highlighted maybe some of the security elements. How would I unfold that for things like identity management, patching, firewall review, and server monetization? Well, let's just kind of go back to identity management. For identity management, I might, you know, we might start taking a look at things like, uh, and am I in drawing mode? No, I need to be in drawing mode, uh, pen. So we might take a look at how you're logging on to other applications. Are you using M365 for logging on to other applications? You might even discover what applications you need to log on to using your cloud app discovery, which you would own. And then once you've discovered all these applications, okay, I've got some Salesforce and obviously I've got all my Office 365, like OneDrive and email. Now you might say, okay, for some situations, I might want to um, have a second factor authentication. But MFA all the time for everybody might not be the route I want. Maybe there are certain priorities of applications 
or personnel or data that is accessed. And so you can use terms like conditional access to line that up with MFA to say, hey, if they're on the network or they're at my remote office, or even if they're coming in via VPN, as long as they're already authenticated and in those locations, I'm okay with them not MFAing. But in situations where they're coming in um, in other ways, I want to MFA them, or for certain applications, I want to MFA. So conditional access is kind of the traffic cop that allows you to say, what are the rules for when you're going to uh, provide MFA? You can also layer on things like risk-based access. So like, what is the real-time risk of my identity at this time? I like to think of it as like a FICO score, um, which alternates all the time. Maybe you had a recent password change, or maybe your credentials were found on the dark web, which would mean that you know that would flow to something called your risk-based score, and maybe that would change whether we're going to MFA or block you from logging in during uh, certain times or conditions. So again, all of this can be um, leveraged and unfolded as part of identity management. Uh, also, obviously, looking at privileged accounts and, and things of that nature, um, even uh, you know taking a look out at devices and having what devices are enrolled and uh, what's their timing for that. We can incorporate a number of things under identity management, but um, that's just kind of taking us into the weeds a little bit. And you can do a similar strategy, right? And sometimes the technology you own helps and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes uh, like a firewall review is something done uh, you know, manually and then with some tools uh, that are not part of this stack. So I just kind of wanted to fold that out. Um, email hygiene and safety, if you already own um, and many organizations do, this set of technologies from Microsoft is fantastic, right? Why not employ it? It is literally a checkbox and um, a little bit of configuration for who you want to provide anti-phishing protection for and from, but um, that is great technology. Um, we're going to have a lot more organizations owning that as, uh, as we see more organizations potentially purchasing business premium. Um, so, Long story short is uh, we need to unfold the technology you own to provide the security you need um, to kind of match up uh, the needs of the organization um, to protect data. So I won't spend time uh, you know, covering the walk package in, in more detail, but you can imagine we can assemble a walk package that you know, addresses additional priorities uh, from your initial uh, onset things like incident response and what to do when an event does occur. Um, security awareness training oftentimes is in the crawl package. Uh, a lot of organizations are uh, moving towards that, but maybe you have some elements of security training that you were trying to do, but uh, it's just not mature um, uh, to where you're providing it to all organizations, um, where you're doing regular testing, and where you're literally trying to raise the bar, if you will, with regards to security awareness in your company and other things that are kind of falling along there. So again, I won't dive into detail as to how some of these match up into the um, technologies you potentially own, um, but uh, do know that you know plans could be developed to kind of literally tie this stuff across and say, let's take advantage of what you own. Um, we just need to pair that up with a little consulting expertise or a little configuration uh, to make that happen. And similar in the run package. So just kind of letting you see what a plan looks like with crawl, walk, run, uh, and security maturity, as we would like to call it. So I'll wrap up with the idea that uh, we have two events I think that you should be aware of. One is on Thursday of this week. Um, it is uh, in the spirit of security awareness, as well as the spirit of Halloween. Uh, we have a cleverly titled Click or Treat. Uh, don't let your employees become victims. And this is where we are going to articulate what a good security awareness program looks like. Um, We'll call it a mature security awareness program. It should include elements of this, 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 and this. And you can kind of self-assess and say, hey, you know what? I've got a couple elements, but I really could buck up my game here. And um, you know, we hope to unfold that in a half hour time frame on Thursday. Also, I'd like to have you hold the date. Um, we are intending to have an M365 security workshop where we're going to dive into some of those circles and, and literally do a little deeper dive. This is actually hands-on where you're going to be provided a lab. Um, it's an hour and a half long. Uh, it's, I would call it, I'd say it's less for executives, certainly from a listening perspective. Maybe they want to be in the room, uh, but you may want to have some of your uh, tech folks attending 
security workshop to kind of learn how to unpack some of the technology that uh, likely you own uh, within your uh, M365 suite. And that'll kind of close out the year for uh, events for us, uh, but those are some ones forthcoming. And then um, I did want to call some attention to our blogs. Recently, we've written uh, one on ransomware top 10. So what are 10 technologies we think you should be doing to prevent uh, ransomware? This goes above and beyond, or it provides probably a little more detail than our ransomware guide, uh, which is also available on our website, downloadable, and some other summary information from uh, this month in Teams from our event last week. So with that, I certainly will take any questions if there are any out there. Otherwise, uh, uh, appreciate you attending uh, this month in cyber for October, and um, have a great month.